I want to welcome you to the Atlantic Council. I'm Stu Eisenstadt, a former UN U.S. Ambassador to the EU. As co-chair of the Global Business and Economic Program's Euro Growth Initiative, I'm very pleased to see all of you here today. I'm delighted to have Euro Growth President and Minister of Finance of Portugal, Mario Centeno, join us for his first speech in the U.S. and his new role as Euro Growth President. I look forward to hearing, as I know you do, his vision for the future of the EU's economic and monetary union. The good news is that Europe is growing again. Confidence and investment is up. Unemployment numbers are decreasing. However, the EU and its member states continue to face structural economic challenges, ones we laid out in a report last year for our task force. Growth is still lower than in the United States, particularly unemployment is high among youth. Capital markets are not as broad and deep as they are in the United States, with much greater dependence on commercial bank debt. President Centeno has referred to a window of opportunity to make determined reform progress at the EU level and to deepen the economic and monetary union. We brought the Euro Growth Initiative to life with the goal of providing a blueprint of how to restore sustainable and inclusive economic growth across all of Europe. Today, the Euro Growth Initiative offers a platform to stimulate thinking on how to use the current window for reform to increase the EU's economic resilience. In our view, sustainable and inclusive economic growth is a key way to revive confidence in the European democratic system and stem the rise of populism and protectionism. In addition, our initiative aims to underscore why a strong and united Europe with robust economic growth is vitally important not just to the people of Europe, but to the people of the United States itself. This is an important moment for the European Union. France's President Macron is pushing for an ambitious overhaul of the EU's economic architecture. Germany now has a government in place, and EU leaders have committed themselves to finalize key Eurozone reform proposals at an EU summit in June. We would very much like to hear from President Centeno what reform proposals have a realistic chance to be implemented in the near future, such as the completion of the banking union with a common deposit insurance program. As I've said, Mr. Centeno is the president of the Eurogroup and the Minister of Finance of the Portuguese Republic. He also serves as chairman of the European Stability Mechanisms Board of Governors. As the de facto finance head of the Eurozone, he has the important task of steering the reform process to deepen the EU's integration at a time when that project is being contested in other areas. Mr. Centeno was sworn in as the finance minister and member of the parliament in Portugal in 2015. Prior to that, he worked at the Central Bank of Portugal starting in 2000, working as an economist and an assistant director of the bank's economic department. Mr. President, we're very delighted to have you, and we really look forward to hearing your remarks. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me today. Thank you to the Atlantic Council to, for organizing this, uh, this lunch. I am a very much convinced European. I have learned to admire the United States for its openness, free spirit, and leadership, and I think we have a lot to share from our experiences. It's been more than 20 years since I returned home from Harvard, but I still bother my friends with stories about American practices, policies that Europeans could learn from. I hope not to be bored yourselves today as I talk about policies that have brought Europe back from the crisis and the policies need to strengthen the Europe. 
I am doing this not just because I firmly believe we can all learn from each other, but because times have somewhat changed. Europe is back. After going through a, the deepest financial crisis in 80 years, the euro resisted and the economy has now turned the page. We are growing fast for 20 consecutive quarters. Per capita levels of GDP are improving faster than the US for, the, for, straight, for four straight years, if we count the period from 2016 to 2019, as we now forecast. Europe has outperformed before, but this time it really is different. Growth is broad-based. It is sustainable, driven by private consumption with investment picking up speed. In the euro area, business cycles and fiscal positions in member states are today more closely aligned than before. The dichotomy between big versus small, periphery versus core, or north versus south is losing relevance. The reasons for Europe's success are at the center of current political debates. Crises have historically pushed countries towards protectionism. Europe rejected that path. During the crisis, countries have enacted structural reforms and opened up their markets, attracting investment from the rest of the world. Today, the European Union is the most open of the world's largest economies. We have accumulated a sizable trade surplus and cut fiscal deficit down to less than 1% of GDP on average, which puts us in a unique, healthy position at the international level to face the future. Another classic response to crisis is to weaken social protection. In Europe, however, the welfare model prevailed as it cushioned some of the impact of the downturn to our citizens. At the same time, we managed to get more and more people into work. The employment rate has been increased since the crisis, and we fared better than the US in this indicator since the early 2000s. In fact, the current uh, period of employment growth uh, in the euro area is the strongest period of employment growth ever recorded in such a short period of time in those countries. At this juncture, uh, our message for the rest of the world is very clear. Social protection and an economic openness helped us to recover and to outperform and worked for the benefit of many, not the few. Let me turn to the euro, which played its part in this economic success story. At the height of the crisis, many economists and investors bet the farm on the breakup of the euro area. In insight, their forecasts were greatly exaggerated, to say the least. Why were they wrong? One of the reasons is that they have underestimated the political resolve to keep the euro together. The euro is not just a currency. It is a key part of the project of shared sovereignty, which brought Europeans together in the aftermath of the Second World War. Three in four Europeans support the common currency. This is not a misleading average. Support is indeed widespread, even in countries that faced higher levels of hardship, such as Greece and my own country, Portugal. When the going got tough, European leaders took decisive steps to strengthen the institutions that underpin the euro. We've agreed to coordinate economic and budgetary policies more closely, and we have done this with great success. We've agreed to adopt structural reforms at national level to reduce imbalances. We've set up a rescue fund with 500 billion firepower to provide financial assistance to states that run into financial troubles. We've centralized the supervision and resolution of banks, weakening the boom, the doom loop, sorry, between sovereigns and the banking system. To borrow a famous code, EU leaders did what it took to save the euro. And it was enough. Some of you may say it was just enough. I recognize that at times it felt too close a call. 
Yeah, I also recognize that the institutional framework underpinning the euro is not complete. And incomplete institutions, even at the best of times, can only produce incomplete results. More is needed to shield the euro against future crises. The question before us is the following. Can we do it? Or will we be defeated by complacency that grows in good times? An often repeated argument by the euro skeptics is that the euro area doesn't form an optimal currency area. Euro area economies are too different, therefore exposed to asymmetric shocks. In the absence of monetary independence, only labor mobility and large transfers can ease the, those shocks, uh, or so the argument goes. It is also very common for policymakers and commentators to draw parallels with the dollar and the US monetary system. Since I am speaking to an American audience, I would like to reflect a little bit on this. The US is really not exactly a, an optimal currency area. What is more, even in the US, risk sharing is limited. I would say more, it remains deliberately limited. Perhaps the most striking example is the strict enforcement of the non, no bailout norm for member, states, for member states in the US. Unlike in the European Union, where financial assistance was provided, uh, was provided member states in difficulties, US states can go under. Because of this budgetary straitjacket, fiscal policy at state level tends to be procyclical. But in contrast with the European Union, fiscal transfers from the federal budget and from financial markets help to absorb economic shocks. Things did have to be like this, and they were not meant to be like this. In the in 70, in 1970s, so I take you back to Lewis Hamilton, the first US finance minister sought to mutualize public debt. In a clever political move, he relieved cash-strapped states uh, of the debt burden in exchange for giving the federal government the power to tax and issue coinage. But his fiscal and monetary union was really undone in less than three decades as a result of political opposition to centralized power. This resembles something. The US economy then entered a period of recurrent boom and bust cycles with doom loops between the banking system and the states. 150 years was the time it took for US monetary institutions to evolve into an arrangement that could bring about stability. The dollar, as we know it, was introduced only 70 years after the Hamilton plan. Following the war of succession, it was the currency of Victoria states of the North. Then, in the early 20th century, state opposition to setting up a central bank was overcome. The centralization of bank resolution and the creation of federal deposit guarantee in the wake of the Great Depression was one of the final pieces of the puzzle and a hard one to get. Since the 1880s, Congress discussed about 150 proposals before deposit insurance became political acceptable. By taking this journey back uh, in time, uh, I sought to show that institutional arrangements that underpinned the dollar were not written on a clean slate, nor were they ever devised as an optimal solution. The truth is that opposition to pooling of risks, which was no milder than in Europe, made that impossible. The US monetary system is the result of protracted process of change in which policymakers tried and tested different solutions in response to crisis. What lessons then can we learn from this US experience? First, it can take some time to build an effective monetary system. So we shouldn't be too harsh on Europe and the euro, even if we must move fast to fix its flaws and deliver on the expectations of our citizens. Second, there is no single institutional framework that we need to replicate. Different arrangements can be effective, and these should be agreed within given political constraints. This takes me to the final part of my speech, our plans to complete the euro. One of our priorities is to complete the banking union. 
The European stability mechanism could give the financial backing needed to make resolution of banks more credible in the eyes of financial markets. Another critical step could be to set up a common deposit insurance for banks. Levels of risk vary between banks in different countries because of the piles of bad loans and other legacies from the crisis. Once there is suffi sufficient progress with digesting those, we will set up a European-wide insurance scheme, reducing the overall risk of bank runs. We are also working on reinforcing our crisis management mechanisms. The ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, should be given more responsibility in crisis management with more tools to tackle and help to prevent crisis. In a parallel, a capital markets union should be completed through greater harmonization of bankruptcy and corporate laws and more centralized supervision of financial markets. This will support cross-border investment flows and open up financing sources. In this field, we have indeed a lot to learn from the US. Over-reliance on bank financing reflects the lack of private risk sharing in Europe. Financial market integration would uh, sp spread risks, reduce financial fragmentation, and spur cross-border investment. There are other elements which may feature in our euro area reform plan in the longer term. Some are more controversial, but no less relevant. Fiscal, the fiscal dimension is a case in point. In an attempt to write a near complete contract between the Union and member states, we have made our fiscal rules overly complex. The Stability and Growth Pact uh, was born in a 90 pages document, and 10 years later, it, is, it only can be uh, included in a 600 pages document. They are hard to explain, let alone to understand. We need to make them simpler. A euro area fiscal capacity is also under discussion. There are several options on the table, ranging from a rainy day fund to a complementary unemployment scheme. This could be set up as a dedicated line in the EU budget or be a separate euro area budget. It could finance structural reforms, support investments, or help countries facing asymmetric economic, sh economic shocks. As you n see, we don't lack ideas on how to progress in Europe. But indeed, this is still very much work in progress. Let me conclude now. The steps I have outlined above will make Europe look a little bit more like the United States in terms of institutions. No one should expect a big bang. We are not looking at big banks. Reforms will be agreed and implemented gradually following our democratic procedures. And this is indeed how Europe works and worked in the past. The euro was precisely set up as a step-by-step -step process. What is critical now is that we are able to take the first step to strengthen it. We should not indulge ourselves with past reform successes uh, of the crisis period. They were very brave acts, but we need to continue. Economic growth and a fresh memory of the crisis are the perfect setting to act. If we do not use this window of opportunity, as was mentioned before, I have been using this idea of a window of opportunity, policy credi credibility in Europe will erode over time. And markets fear about the resilience of the euro may come back to haunt us. To achieve an agreement, we will need to acknowledge policy trade-offs and find right, the right balance between reducing the risks and building up risk-sharing instruments at the euro area level. Evidence-based policies can help to bridge the differences. But, it, but in the end, it takes brave politicians to fight for sensible solutions. I often say that uh, institutional design stay, stands for economics as genetics stands for medicine. We have to be quite knowledgeable of what we are 
doing. We are dealing with incentives. We are dealing with uh, moral hazard problems. We all we know a lot about that in economics. We have to bring that knowledge to this process, and there must be some political investment into this process. So political leaders must really be willing to invest in strengthening the euro. I just hope it does not take another crisis for us to do it. And uh, I really think we need to avoid the next crisis. Jamonet, one of the fathers of the European Union, predicted that the Union would only advance in times of crisis. We owe a lot to Jean Monnet, but I sincerely uh, would like us to be able to prove him wrong uh, on this one prediction. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Santano. It is, uh, it is our honor and our pleasure to, to have you here, and thank you for, uh, for your remarks. Um, we will talk about a number of the topics that you raised, hopefully in more detail, and I'll take the prerogative of the moderator to, to ask the first few questions, but then look forward to, to audience questions and comments as well. I wanted to open by uh, talking a little bit more about the window of opportunity that you mentioned, not just an economic window since growth has resumed in Europe, um, unemployment is on a downward trend, Deficits are generally in, in good or better order, um, and debt to GDP is uh, on a decline. There also seems to be a political window of opportunity with a German coalition now in place, some of the more nerve-wracking elections behind us. Um, what are you hoping to achieve at the EU summit in June? What would make it a success in terms of the reforms that you've talked about? Thank you, Bart, again. Um, the, um, the window of opportunity is indeed a, also a political window of opportunity, taking uh, the benefit of new, fresh, fresh political and electoral cycles uh, coming out uh, in Europe, in France, in Germany, uh, now in Italy. Um, it's, it's difficult in Europe to align all these uh, electoral and political cycles, so we cannot indeed, uh, or we should not, <laughs> to be a little more, more modest, uh, lose this uh, window uh, of opportunity. There are European elections on May 2019, uh, and then a new political cycle in Europe uh, at the European level uh, will start. Uh, so this is about time for us to take this, this opportunity. And we have been working towards the June summit to be able to, to produce a more detailed roadmap um, in terms of the uh, uh, completion of the European uh, Monetary Union. This means uh, taking decisions uh, on, on, on the banking union dimension in terms of the backstop for the single resolution fund, but also uh, discussing openly and designing uh, uh, an avenue uh, of work uh, and the political decisions on the third pillar of the banking union, uh, which is the deposit insurance uh, scheme, which in my view um, needs to be complementary to the national uh, deposit uh, insurance schemes and can indeed deal with the, the risks that we see from differences in banking sectors in Europe and we need to tackle those uh, differences uh, uh, over time uh, in a very effective way. We also uh, are discussing and we have uh, significant progress uh, on the role of the ESM in crisis management in Europe, um, certainly reinforcing the role of the ESM without overlapping uh, this work and this role with one existing for the European Commission. Uh, there, there is a memorandum of understanding uh, among the SM, or between the SM and, and the, com the European Commission that will show precisely how, how to move forward also on this. Um, and then we have um, uh, what 
we sometimes call more longer term issues that up to June uh, we need to uh, revise and reschedule in the, the roadmap that uh, along the tradition, as I mentioned in my uh, speech, along the tradition of the European Union will certainly be a step-by-step -step approach to build trust around the table. Uh, trust is easier to build when things are good. Uh, so this is also an opportunity for each one of us to show effective action uh, in um, dealing with, uh, with, uh, with the legacies of the crisis. We all know that these legacies uh, are asymmetric distributed uh, across, across Europe, but we also know that each country is um, very much committed with uh, reducing those legacies. And 2017 is a very good example of that. Um, uh, both from the perspective, for example, I'm going only to mention two indicators. Uh, public debt uh, over GDP ratio, which is now uh, receding in, uh, in all countries, uh, and NPLs, uh, non-performing loans. Uh, in which also all uh, banking institutions that are supervised by the, SN, uh, the SSM and the ECB uh, met the targets that were established by the supervisory board uh, in terms of reducing NPLs. And this is quite impressive uh, as a matter uh, of commitment. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, just picking up on, on your remarks and perhaps a follow-on question to, to that one. Um, there are those governments and those uh, countries, well, the, the Dutch, uh, the Finns, the Irish, uh, even Nordic countries that are not currently in the monetary union, who, who warn against too fast a pace of decision making around such thing as a third pillar uh, and around such topics as even further out euro bonds and uh, other uh, forms of mutualization. What, what is your answer to those concerns? What would your well, we have to be very clear of what is at stake. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, um, no one is asking for permanent transfers. So um, we are very much aware uh, of the type of mechanisms and instruments that uh, we consider uh, that are lacking uh, in, in the European institutional design and what they are uh, meant for. Uh, and on the other hand, um, we have uh, to deal, as I mentioned also before, uh, to deal with the um, type of moral hazard problems that uh, some of the insurance mechanisms that we are uh, discussing as a matter of risk sharing may create and properly uh, take care uh, of, those, uh, of those risks and there are instruments to do it. Besides these, uh, we, uh, we, have a we have been having already for quite some time very open and frank discussions. Uh, Europe has to uh, face uh, the challenges that are mainly external, the Brexit, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the challenges that now uh, trade policy uh, also plays to, 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 the, to the global growth. Uh, and um, we need uh, we need to uh, be very uh, we, we need to act together also on those issues and, and understand <coughs> that the stronger uh, we we make the euro the best uh, we can we can uh, react to to the difficulties ahead. Europe um, produces huge savings, mm -hmm. several billion of euros. Uh, of savings due to the external trade position of Europe. These savings uh, need to be invested also in the European future. Uh, this is a safeguard uh, for an economic area that is the single largest market in the world. Um, and uh, uh, we have to understand that the best way to do this, to do this is indeed completing the banking union, the capital markets union, so that the uh, inner f workings of the of the of, of the euro area and the European Union may uh, be uh, in benefit of of the citizens. Mm 
Okay. Thank you, Minister. Uh, let's pivot, uh, if, if we may, to uh, Portugal. You're very fond of reminding audiences that you've both won the European Eurovision Song Festival and the European Soccer Championship. <laughs> uh, economically, you seem to be doing quite well also. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the lessons learned in terms of, uh, you now have a deficit that's trending towards 1%, your debt is on the decline, uh, unemployment is declining. Uh, what about the policy mix that you pursued uh, can you share that might be uh, instructive to other to this audience and, and other audiences? First, let me tell you that Portugal uh, indeed um, uh, went through uh, more than one decade of reforms uh, of the labor market, of social security, of the educational system, uh, and these are paying off today. Um, the, the increased competitiveness that we see uh, from our exports. Our exports are, have been gaining market share uh, since the last seven years. Uh, in 2017 uh, alone, uh, Portuguese exports increased uh, above external demand to Portugal uh, more than uh, three percentage points. Uh, and this is um, a quite impressive gain in competitiveness for, for Portugal. Uh, and part of this I want to see associated with um, a much better equipped labor force uh, and uh, of uh, uh, an reforms that were in introduced in the labor market in, 20, uh, in, in 2009, uh, in 2012 again, that, um, that improved quite substantially the, the capacity of the Portuguese economy to be competitive. Um, and then uh, lately uh, we have uh, reformed the financial sector, stabilized the financial sector. Portugal was the only uh, European country in 2016 and 2017 to be able to attract uh, capital to the banking sector from the four corners of the world, from Asia, China, mm -hmm. from Africa, Europe, and from the US. Uh, we finalized the resolution and the selling uh, of Novo Banco, which is uh, the third largest bank in Portugal, uh, to a U.S. Uh, investor. Uh, this uh, finalized a, a very difficult process that we started in December 2015 to stabilize the largest uh, banking institutions in Portugal. Uh, and this increased confidence in the economy, both internally and externally. We have been um, updated to uh, uh, investment grade by the uh, major uh, um, rating agencies. Uh, and uh, um, we have uh, been able also to couple these uh, successes with uh, soccer and uh, song <laughs> contest uh, 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 successes that, that were very much welcome. It is. It is a long process, uh, a process that the uh, Portuguese society endured very, very well, uh, with a great resilience, both from the perspective of the political, uh, um, the political uh, scenario, uh, but uh, mainly, and uh, I want to uh, underline this very much, uh, on uh, the reaction of families and firms uh, in Portugal that took the, the role to, to, this, uh, to this success. The fiscal, uh, uh, only a few words on the, on the fiscal side, um, we, uh, we are now in a downward trajectory for the public debt over GDP ratio. Uh, in 2017, it has been reduced by more than five, four percentage points which is the single largest uh, reduction in 20 years. Um, the deficit last year was 0 0.9. Without one-offs was 0 0.8. Uh, this is below the EU average uh, and is again a very significant um, figure for uh, our quite rigorous expenditure review uh, and, uh, of course, also helped by the uh, increase in employment and uh, GDP. We are converging with the euro area, finally, 
uh, that, that we witnessed also last year. Thank you, Minister. Picking up on that last comment about uh, the fiscal position, uh, one of your predecessors, Vito Karspar, at the IMF issued the uh, fiscal monitor uh, this week and sounded the alarm bells about uh, government debt levels uh, globally, um, Europe being slightly below, below some of those, those averages. I wanted to go back to the comments you made about the importance of fiscal rules in Europe and the complexity of fiscal rules. Uh, we have seen very significant compliance this year with a 3% deficit rule uh, throughout mm -hmm. the, the monetary union. One doesn't hear a lot these days about the 60% debt to GDP rule. That's also a Maastricht uh, criterion. Uh, how do you see policies evolve? How important is that going to be in the future? Uh, if some countries, including Portugal, Spain, others, if they were ever to be put back on a trajectory towards that 60%, th there's a long period of adjustment still to go. Uh, what do you see as future policy there? Yeah, you, you touched upon uh, one idea that uh, I am a big fan, which is uh, a long process, so you need to be patient. Uh, I, I have been <laughs> being vocal uh, on, on the idea of uh, uh, authorities, uh, European and national uh, authorities, uh, of, being, of being patient. Uh, uh, indeed, the state is the main supplier of patients in a, in a society, uh, and we cannot we cannot uh, give away this this capacity. Uh, and these are processes that take a long time. Uh, but uh, once you are in a good trajectory, uh, what we know from uh, the research in economics is that the important thing for a country to alleviate the pressure of debt on growth is for the debt to GDP ratio to be in a, in a declining path. This is what uh, instill confidence on investors uh, internally. Uh, this uh, the leveraging, uh, it's more costly in the early stages than, than afterwards. So we need to build uh, on that. And that is precisely the goal uh, for Portugal, but it's also shared for by, by uh, all uh, European countries. Cross-sectionally, uh, we are at the, uh, at the lowest uh, level of dispersion in fiscal positions in the euro area. Since the mid-90s, mm -hmm. we have harmonized data since 95. We never had such a low dispersion in fiscal positions in uh, the euro area. Uh, and this is the result of, uh, uh, of the uh, surveillance uh, multilateral surveillance of the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, and this is indeed also translating this coordination of fiscal policies uh, is uh, translating also in the debt uh, reduction. Uh, Portugal is complying with the debt rule uh, in Europe and it will continue to do so uh, in the four years uh, horizon of the stability program that we are going to sent to Brussels at the end of this, of this month after presenting it in Parliament next week. Uh, and, and this um, commitment is shared by uh, all uh, European countries. So the, um, the, the so-called restriction is there, the 60%, and we are uh, doing uh, the best uh, to comply with it. Again, with patience and um, the political economy of reforms, for me, it's very simple to outline. It's a triplet of reforms, which means supply uh, measures, demand, because we need to uh, allow these reforms to uh, survive and to mature over the business cycle, and patience, because uh, we need to stick uh, behind these reforms, and all institutions, but all institutions need to, uh, to be uh, also uh, supportive uh, of uh, reform uh, and uh, uh, business cycle management policies that we can implement in our countries. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, one final question for me, and then I'll turn it to the audience. Uh, we have to talk about Greece. Uh, Greece is uh, expected to exit from its third program later this year. 
there was a long list, uh, over 80 reforms, uh, including politically sensitive ones around gas and electricity and, and the like, <coughs> that needed to compl be completed. You've voiced significant op optimism about uh, Greece's government's capacity and, and, and willingness to pursue those reforms and execute them. Uh, one final discussion that needs to be had, and I, I hope and expect is being had, is around debt relief for, for Greece, and you've been vocal around that as well. Can you share your thoughts uh, on that and where you see that discussion going? We can now see uh, Greece um, as going out of the wood. Uh, it's uh, about eight years of programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the 88 uh, prior actions that were needed um, to comply, to, to finalize the third review uh, of the current program. Uh, but now we are, have, a, again, a long list of uh, other actions that are needed. Um, it's impressive, the capacity of the Greek government to, um, to implement uh, and to uh, legislate and to uh, uh, stand behind this, um, this very uh, uh, significant number of measures. Greece is, is growing. Uh, uh, as, ad, as all other European countries, uh, Greece achieved a fiscal position uh, that presents a primary surplus mm -hmm. of uh, quite uh, substan substantial uh, dimension. Um, and uh, the key thing now for Greece, uh, in my opinion, uh, is, uh, and, f and for Europe, is to hand over the ownership of all this economic model uh, of growth that Greece today has, and of course it is different from what happened in the past with Greece, um, and this ownership now uh, has to be uh, given out to the Greek authorities. Uh, and pretty much as uh, the example of Portugal shows, this uh, ownership uh, needs to prove resilient across political and economic cycles. We did that in Portugal. There was a change in the political cycle, nothing <laughs> uh, changed in the commitment of the country uh, in terms of uh, the major goals which we all share uh, as important for the future uh, in Portugal. It, it, it has to happen the same thing in Greece and I think we are in a good position uh, to work the institutions and the Greek authorities for that to be, to be true uh, so that the world of the game can be indeed ownership. In Portugal, I've been saying that we couple ownership with credibility, uh, meeting the targets, beating the IMF <laughs> forecast for Portugal is of major importance uh, for a country uh, that has to return to the markets and to restore mm -hmm. reputation and credibility. And this is very, very important for, for the economy. Ambassador Eisenstadt. There's a microphone that will be passed around if you. Thank you. You focused a lot on Portugal and appropriately so. I'd like to raise it to the EU level and talk about that. There's obviously an anti EU attitude among a number of uh, member states in the, in the East. Uh, and that would seem to complicate your job in terms of the economic and monetary union make it more difficult for President Macron's vision to be implemented. Uh, would you talk about that and talk about whether the only way, to, therefore, to have deeper integration uh, across economic and monetary union, given these uh, anti-EU populist feelings, is a two-speed uh, Europe, and does that have any legs, or will that be resisted as well by the same forces? <coughs> you are absolutely right uh, when you say that um, there is there is a, there are different views uh, in different countries, sometimes even within the country uh, on Europe and how to to, to proceed. Um, the, the, the what we can do about it uh, is. Uh, indeed not, not to delay the, the political debate uh, and to be able, and this is something that either we do have or we do not have, 
uh, the ability uh, to, to show to people uh, what are the benefits uh, of uh, uh, completing the, uh, the EMU. Um, you know, the challenges are quite diverse. If you go to a country such as Lithuania uh, that had a huge and vast migration of young people, uh, the, the uh, Lithuania may, may be uh, interested in fiscal uh, instruments that, uh, that may um, kind of uh, cope uh, with, this, uh, with this type of uh, migration processes. Not very different from what happens in the US uh, because migration is indeed uh, one of the key aspects uh, of uh, uh, monetary and economic union to work. But we don't have that. Then you go to uh, countries like Ireland and you see the, that the concern is Brexit today and the impact of Brexit in Ireland may be higher, uh, larger than in other countries. So each, each country uh, raises indeed, and I think they are rightly <laughs> doing so, uh, their own concerns vis-a-vis -vis the process that, that is quite challenging. Uh, all in all, uh, what we have to do is to uh, pull those concerns together uh, and uh, um, uh, build trust around, around the table uh, to, to design uh, the final uh, set of measures that, that will uh, uh, allow the, the big savings that I was uh, comment on, commenting on before can indeed be invested in Europe. Europe has uh, largest wage differentials within the European Union compared with the US. Uh, we have a um, convergence process that, uh, is, uh, that lags behind the convergence process that we uh, observed over two centuries uh, in, in the US. This is perfectly understandable because the European integration process uh, is much younger than, than, than the US. Um, we know also from economics that these convergence processes take a quite a long time to, to build up. We again <coughs> need to continue this process of reinforcement of uh, institutions to cope with the diversity of views that indeed exist. Thank you. Ma'am, and as you ask your question, please state your name and your affiliation if you would. Hello, my name is Vaso Angeletto from Insider Greece. Uh, I would like to come back to Greece. Um, is there a discussion about a new program or an extension? Because there have been uh, some news reports in the German price, press. And whether you will pursue an agreement with the IMF in Washington Group meeting tomorrow? Thank you. Opportunity to make news. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> There are, I mean, there are no talks uh, of such a thing as an extension uh, of, of the Greek program. The Greek authorities are uh, very much focused uh, on, on the exit uh, of the program, on finalizing it by August, on having all steps uh, uh, implemented uh, until then. Um, Th there is no such thing as uh, right before and right after the exit of the program, as I was uh, mentioning before. It's very, very important that the old process uh, resists and uh, goes to the end of the, of the, the in terms of ownership for, for the Greek people, society and authority. So it's very, very important. Um, and uh, uh, of course, there are still decisions um, to to, to take on, uh, on the continuation of this process, uh, but uh, uh, those uh, are framed very well uh, around uh, the debt uh, mechanisms that, that we uh, see for the medium and longer term uh, and uh, around the typical surveillance that uh, Portugal, Ireland <laughs> and other uh, program countries also have um, and we still are have, have, have them in Portugal, so it's, it's not 
something to worry about. Thank you. Sir. Ferdinand Giuliano, Bloomberg View. Um, I, we heard just a few hours ago your German colleague, Olaf Scholz, was somewhat cautious about the idea of a common deposit insurance scheme setting one up in, uh, in June. So I was wondering what you can offer concretely to the Germans to change their mind, which is also acceptable to other countries. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, about the red lines from Italy and France over sovereign exposures in banks' balance sheets. So do you have that silver bullet which can make Olaf Scholz change his mind over deposit insurance? And just another question is, if there were no agreement on deposit insurance in June, would you consider the summit a failure, given the political uh, cycle which starts again from next year? Well, you know, silver, silver bullets, whenever they do exist, they only show up in the last scene of the movie. You remember <laughs> all, all, all Antonio Banderas movies, when there, is, when there is a silver bullet, it is obviously uh, not shown before the final, the final scene uh, of the movie. Well, um, I'm not going to reveal if I have a silver bullet or not, or if there is one such, uh, such, a, such a thing. Uh, but uh, uh, just, just to match the, the, what I just said with uh, what Minister Olaf Scholz uh, is, uh, said and uh, uh, repeated a little bit on, on a, in a panel that we shared uh, with uh, Madame Lagarde uh, a couple of hours ago. Um, we, uh, we are um, working uh, at a technical level and we have to start discussing discussions at the political level on all issues uh, and among those issues the deposit insurance scheme. Uh, it is a pillar of the banking union, uh, a recognized pillar of the banking union, so um, we need to, uh, to, to discuss the issue and to come up um, with a, a solution that, again, as I mentioned before, can be, uh, can be uh, a zone, a landing zone or a comfort zone to everyone around the table. Uh, it's a quite sensitive issue, we all know that, uh, but uh, it's something that we need, we need to tackle. One possibility, uh, as I mentioned also uh, in my intervention, is for it uh, to be, and I also referred to this dimension uh, before, to be complementary to national schemes. Mm -hmm. And as an economics, we are very good to deal with that. Uh, uh, also to, to have different, uh, different uh, prices, different costs for different banks depending on the risk riskiness of the bank. We have, a, uh, I mean, quite a substantial number of uh, instruments uh, to, be, to deal with uh, when uh, taking care of, uh, of, of that. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, I am very hopeful that uh, the silver bullet <laughs> will uh, appear. But uh, uh, to June, the idea is to detail the roadmap and to establish the sequencing uh, of reforms. And if we, uh, the historians uh, of the European construction <laughs> process, know that this will be a step-by-step -step approach uh, with uh, full control by all countries uh, of what is going on. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I'm Conrad Tribble from the Department of State. Could you talk a few minutes about the transatlantic dimension of your work? What about the US-EU relationship currently or historically affects what you do and how you can do it, what you hope to achieve, and what, what, uh, what might happen? We've had, in the past, disagreements on the, in this area of fiscal policy. It's been much more in the area of trade more recently. But what's your sense of that for your work going forward? It's, it's, uh, it's not really a, a subject or a matter for the Eurogroup uh, to deal with. 
um, we we are finance ministers, of course, and uh, in that perspective, I can I can uh, tell you a little bit what is the the Portuguese perspective and the perspective that we have been sharing at the ECOFIN level. Um, the as you know, uh, talks uh, on these subjects uh, are coordinated at the European Commission level. Uh, this is the common policy uh, for Europe that we want to pursue and to continue uh, on that uh, dimension. Of course, transatlantic issues are of utmost importance for all countries in Europe. I, I, I may also say especially for Portugal or in particular for Portugal because they indeed are quite important for us. Um, we, we are the closest neighbors <laughs> uh, of, uh, of, of the US uh, and, and we see ourselves um, as uh, uh, certainly uh, 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 attaching a great uh, importance to, to these issues. Um, Europe is an open economy. Uh, we project ourselves as uh, in terms of the economic model uh, being uh, uh, an open uh, an open economy uh, with uh, strong ties uh, with uh, the US uh, and uh, we think this is the way to continue so uh, national policies uh, are uh, certainly uh, legitimate the coordination of this type of policies uh, that occur in different fora, for example, the OECD can be one such fora, uh, we can uh, and we should uh, invest uh, our political time uh, on that uh, to make, uh, to make the, the final design of whatever decisions are taken uh, to the benefit of, uh, of the set of, uh, of citizens that we represent. <coughs> Thank you. Barbara? Thank you. Barbara Matthews, the Atlantic Council. I'm wondering if you could provide some perspective on how the Eurogroup views the role of the EIB in infrastructure finance and delivering growth to Europe. It's obviously a significant partner. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking of ways it can change and evolve as you evolve? The, the, the EIB uh, has uh, been played recently an even more important role uh, in, uh, in the European policy connected with the so-called Juncker plan. Uh, and uh, uh, we think uh, uh, it is a, an obvious pillar uh, of, uh, uh, of to finance uh, European policies. Um, the, Europe, the EIB uh, has plans to uh, expand uh, its operations outside Europe, uh, but uh, um, it has also to cope with Brexit, and is uh, is something that we have to face uh, in the near term uh, and uh, this has to be made in a way that uh, that do not uh, put into question the crucial role uh, of the, the EIB uh, in, in the development of new policies uh, in Europe. The, uh, attaching the EIB to, to the Juncker plan uh, was a very wise decision in terms of expanding the financing capacities uh, of uh, centralized policies or EU level policies in terms of infrastructures uh, and um, uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the evaluation we can make today of this is very positive uh, and if I can forecast in that dimension the future, uh, I'll say that it can only be uh, reinforced. Okay. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, seeing none, let me ask you one concluding question because we've talked about uh, the economic window of opportunity, the political window of opportunity. Uh, you mentioned the market environment and, and that markets might run out of patience or might, uh, without rhyme or reason, even in the real economy, uh, the 
uh, stop supporting European banks, stop supporting European sovereigns as they uh, try to go to market. How are you engaged in communicating the urgency of some of these reforms uh, to complete the European project? And uh, what do you see as the main risks in terms of the market environment in which you have to operate? The, the, the truth is that um, not, not, not producing certainly uh, a market analysis uh, of the recent uh, uh, months but uh, but markets uh, have been also quite accommodative <laughs> to mm -hmm. to the to the uncertainties and risks that that we see, uh, and I think that is important uh, to to note uh, and to take into account because uh, uh, on the one hand we can interpret these uh, as markets being positive vis-à-vis uh, -vis the the prospects of uh, reform and uh, and of. Uh, uh, further, the, the decisions that that we are about uh, to take uh, s certainly uh, w uh, 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 an economic area that suffered from uh, the type of um, uh, difficulties in market access of some of its member states uh, needs to take that uh, into account. Um, and what I see. Um, is uh, completing these institutions uh, will also uh, open up possibilities for financing in Europe that today are not available. For example, the Capital Markets Union is a major uh, example, example of that. Uh, and um, I'll say that, of course, being a politician today, <laughs> we need to work to the, to, the, to the future of our citizens, but uh, we also live in a general equilibrium setting in which uh, all market participants need need to be uh, taken into account. So uh, I, I think this uh, adds an, an extra degree uh, of responsibility for the uh, for the decisions we have to take uh, in the near future, so that we don't deceive anyone. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Uh, let me thank the Ambassador and, and your team at the Ministry, our team here at the Atlantic Council for helping us uh, stage this event and then thank you all very much for attending. Mr. Minister, it has been an honour for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for answering our questions and we hope thank to see you, so you again much. here frequently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.